During lockdown, our friend Pam Butler, who's a member of Little Hill Church, has been revisiting an interest from her younger days, which is that of writing poems with a Christian theme. She's made a collection of these poems and a friend has put together in a booklet some of these poems and entitled it Thoughts in Isolation and Comfort in COVID. Here is one of the poems that's in the book uh, based on the theme of God's steadfast love. God's steadfast love. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yes, that is the place we would be to worship the one who's adored. And will our God ever forget the people who call on his name? We're inscribed on the palms of his hands because it's for us that he came. So God chooses not to recall the sins we so often commit. So never forget and give thanks because it's for heaven we're fit. Let us pray for his peace in our hearts. May we always in him feel secure, for we know in whom we've put our trust and his love remains steadfast and sure. The Bible reading is taken from Psalm 136 verse 1 to 9. That's Psalm 136 verses 1 to 9. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. For um, God spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. We're going to turn to our scripture reading for tonight, and that is the book of Hebrews, and it is chapter 9, and it is verse 16 to 27. So Hebrews 9. And starting to read at verse 16. I'll just wait for you to get there. It's always good. Uh, you don't hear it online, do you? The sound of paper turning, paper pages turning. But it's always good to hear it. God's word says this. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, uh, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and uh, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves were with better sacrifices than these. Uh, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God 
on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Good evening, everyone at Little Hill. It's a great joy to be able to see some of you and to join with you. It's been a great privilege and I'm very grateful to the officers at Little Hill for very graciously and kindly inviting me to share with you these three Sunday evenings. Uh, they've already been, uh, what should we say, brave enough, courageous enough to invite me to do another three uh, evenings with you in uh, later in the year. And maybe we can actually be together in the, uh, in the building itself by then, but we'll have to see, won't we? I've prepared a script of the message for tonight, which I've sent to Andy or be on the Little Hill website, if that might be of any help to any of you. Those of you that have been joining us on these when on these uh, Sunday afternoons will know that I've been continuing in this amazing and great theme of the sovereignty of God, and especially on these three evenings, looking at the wonderful plan of salvation, God's sovereignty in his wonderful plan of salvation. Tonight, though, I want to offer you uh, a few thoughts in answer to just two questions. I don't know how many of you will have come across these two issues, but I've done so on more than one occasion and thought perhaps it might be useful to think about two questions. One is, why was the shedding of Jesus's blood necessary for salvation? And secondly, why did he have to be crucified? Why did he have to die on the cross? So I just want to offer you some suggestions in answer to those two questions. Let's think about the reason why Jesus had to shed his blood, the shedding of his blood. See, the speculation is, and I've come across it before, as I've said, that uh, the Lord Jesus could have died in a variety of ways. Uh, he could have died by strangulation and asphyxiation. He could have died by a, a blow to the head, none of which needed necessarily any shedding of blood. And the argument is that Jesus could have died like that, and the Apostle Paul could still have written to the Christians at Rome and said, Christ Jesus is the one who died, who was raised and at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. The argument is that Jesus could have died in any other way and still have risen, ascended, and be interceding for us. So that, of course, does really beg the question, well, why did Jesus need to die by spilling his blood? The straightforward and simple answer is because it was always God's sovereignly designed method for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, it's a method designed by God, which is indicated even in the Garden of Eden. Uh, after Adam and Eve had sinned, we are told that the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Those skins were animal skins, and therefore an animal or animals had to be slain by God and the carcass skinned. Therefore, there would be shedding of blood in order that Adam and Eve could be covered by God. So I want to say no, right, lay no more emphasis on that than that it is an indication of God's method of covering sinners. And then, of course, 
it is uh, God's design method for the redemption of the people of Israel. Their redemption was very much centered on the spilling and applying of blood. Having been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years, the Lord had appeared to Moses and he said to him, tell the children of Israel that every man shall take a lamb and they shall kill their lamb and they shall take the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses. And then God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Not just when I see the lamb, but when I see the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lintel, I will pass over you. Clearly, right at the start of the redemption of the people of Israel, spilling and applying of blood was necessary to their redemption. And then, of course, having brought them out of uh, Egypt and taken them through the wilderness and into the promised land, it was uh, the shedding of blood was God's design method for his ongoing relationship with his chosen people. Their regular forgiveness of sins depended upon the daily slaughtering of animals, the spilling of their blood, the collecting of that blood, and then applying it in various ways to the people and to various things that were used in the worship of God. Clearly that that was all in God's sovereign will was very emphatically stated by the Lord to Moses when he said to him, the life of flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you, the blood, on the altar to make atonement for your souls. This is clearly God's design method for saving the souls of the people of Israel. It was the basis on which his ongoing forgiveness was ministered to them, these daily blood sacrifices. And so if we have just read in Hebrews chapter 9, or had it read to us, we read, indeed, under the law, the Old Testament law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. As far as God is concerned, right from the start, the shedding of blood is vital to the forgiveness of sins and the redemption of his people. So it was against this graphic background of all these Old Testament sacrifices down through the years that when we come to the days of the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, you'll remember that John saw Jesus coming and pointed to him saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And most of the people that were there listening to John were from a Jewish background. Yes, there were some Roman soldiers, but by and large, they were Jewish people. And when they hear the phrase, the Lamb of God, it would absolutely strike them in the most graphic way. That this person, in some way, was going to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, for the taking away of the sins of people, because that's what the Lamb of God was for throughout their history. These Jewish listeners couldn't possibly have missed the compelling implication that this man's blood was going to be shed for the saving of sinners. And through the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, he was well aware of the absolute necessity of giving his blood in death right through to the Last Supper, where he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, to his disciples, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Notice it's the blood of the covenant. It's the blood of the promise throughout the whole of the Old Testament. And this is given to you for the forgiveness of sins. So 
So the shedding of blood is the only God sovereignly ordained way of salvation in every age, and it is still the same today. And that salvation is through his son by means of his own blood, thus securing redemption. There's no question about the fact that God the Father only ever, ever offers sinners redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. The whole work of saving grace is based then on the shed blood of God's one and only Son. It's only in him that we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace. There is no redemption, there is no forgiveness without the rich grace of God that is given to us through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only means whereby we can find acceptance with our holy God, our creator and our judge is if we have been justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The joy of full forgiveness is only for those who trust and rely entirely on him who has loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. His blood is the propitiation whereby the anger and wrath of God is turned away from us. And it's the reason the church exists. Why is there a local church in Little Hill or in Oadby or anywhere else in the world? Why does the universal church exist? It exists as the church of God because he obtained it with his own blood. The blood of Christ paid the cost to buy, if you like, his true church. True believers, you and I are only united to one another in the church of God and are able to have fellowship with one another because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The Apostle Peter was inspired to write to scattered believers uh, in, in, the, in their day uh, and to assure them that they were still, nevertheless, though they were scattered, though they were persecuted, they were nevertheless God's elect people. And he describes them as the elect people of God according to the foreknowledge of God the Father for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling in his blood. I don't know whether any of you have been christened in a Church of England. Some of you may well have been, or a Methodist church or Presbyterian church, something like that. And that's that's fine in that sense. But the important thing is not to be sprinkled with water, but to be sprinkled by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the method that God uses for forgiving our sins. And so these scattered believers in Peter's day, they could be absolutely confident of their eternal home because they were secure under the covering of the precious blood of their saviour. Most of you will have guessed by now or know already that I was born and brought up in Birmingham. I was saved in a little chapel in, in Birmingham. And I remember so well that we used to sing an old hymn. And in fact, we're going to finish our meeting tonight by singing this hymn. It says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I do trust that all of you who may be here listening and watching tonight 
will make sure that you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour and sheltering under his shed blood. And if you are already a Christian, you know as well as I do that Satan will tempt us to doubt our everlasting salvation. And what can we do? Well, we can remind ourselves and remind him that our Lord Jesus Christ entered once for all into the holy places of glory, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. If you are tempted to doubt your salvation, remember Jesus shed his blood for you to save you and me. So it was vital that our Lord Jesus Christ should die by shedding his blood as the Lamb of God. But then the second question is, but why did that have to be by crucifixion? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ have to be a sacrifice on a cross? Why did he need to be crucified? We read in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, that Jesus, having become a, a man, being incarnate here on earth, being in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And then Paul was inspired to write, even death on a cross. You see, Paul wasn't saying it is enough for Jesus to die somehow. But his death has to even be death on a cross. That last little phrase tells us that no other death would have been sufficient for the redemption of sinful people. And yet, just as the necessity for the shed blood of Christ is questioned, so is the necessity for a crucifixion is questioned. The argument goes like this. Jesus could have shed his blood and still died by some way other than by crucifixion and having shed his blood, died in some other way, he could still be the saviour of the world. So whether he died on a cross or not is really of little consequence. That's how the argument goes. They would say his blood could have been shed if it had been stabbed to death or decapitated. In fact, we acknowledge that much of our Lord's blood was shed before he was hung on a cross. Remember the members of the Sanhedrin, they began to strike him and the guards received him with blows. We received that the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and they beat him and it's very likely that those blows and those beatings drew blood. Pontius Pilate, of course, handed Jesus over to be flogged or scourged. And the Roman scourged was a leather whip of a number of thongs with little bits of bone or metal tied into the ends of them. And as the victim was whipped with the scourge, those bits of metal and bone would chip chunks of flesh out of the body of the victim. And that would lead to severe bleeding. And that was not the end of the bloodletting. The soldiers of the governor then took him into the governor's headquarters and twisting a crown of thorns, they pressed it upon his head and then took a reed and beat that crown of thorns into his head, causing blood to come from his skull. Theoretically, Jesus could have died by shedding his blood at any point during his tortures, before he was nailed or without being nailed to a cross. And yet, the Old Testament makes it perfectly clear that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ would have to be by crucifixion and that that crucifixion was always the solid foundation of God's eternal plan of salvation. The Lord said to Moses, you'll remember in the wilderness, 
make a fiery serpent and set it up on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. And Jesus, in his own ministry, confirmed that this had been a sign given of nearly a thousand years previously of the manner of his death, that the Son of Man must be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that's how Jesus said he must die. In fact, it's very interesting to note that before crucifixion was a well-known method of execution, the Holy Spirit gave King David a foresight of how the Messiah would die. This is about 900 years before Jesus came to die. David could foresee the time when the Messiah would say, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to, the, to my jaws. They have pierced my feet and my hands. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide their garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. An extremely vivid prophecy of what is endured during crucifixion. Isaiah, 700 years before the crucifixion, could foresee that he would be pierced for our transgressions, all indicating death by crucifixion. So why crucifixion? Well, crucifixion was reserved by the Romans for slaves, rebels, pirates, the most infamous malefactors and especially despised criminals. So Jesus, Jesus's crucifixion therefore pointed to the fact that it had been declared to the world for centuries that he would be regarded as especially despised, that he would be treated in his death as the worst, the most infamous of malefactors and criminals. So it was prophesied of him that he would be a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. Isaiah foretold that he would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ was proof that the world considered the Son of God a despicable man. Then crucifixion was intended to be a gruesome public display. And that was prophesied 500 years before by Zechariah when he said they will look on him whom they have pierced. The one they have pierced will be on public display. And that will be fulfilled even more at the end of the world when every eye shall look upon him whom the human race had pierced. Messiah's death by crucifixion had been prophesied as essential to the plan of salvation through the Old Testament, for our Lord's ministry, and on to the end of the world. Mentioning our Lord's ministry, we find that Jesus foretold his death by crucifixion. He said, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die when I am lifted up. 
Crucifixion was a capital punishment which could only be imposed by the Romans. We read, we can read that when the Jews accused Jesus before Pilate, he said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But the Jews said, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus was condemned by the Jews and then crucified by the Gentiles. And that takes us to another point, that the crucifixion was a public statement that the crucified person had been officially cursed by the government. In fact, we are told that in Deuteronomy that a hanged man is cursed by God, the governor of the whole universe. Through crucifixion, as part of God's great sovereign salvation plan, Christ redeemed us from the curse, the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that Jesus' crucifixion was necessary is illustrated by the fact that he died a cursed and most shameful and disgraceful death. You see, crucifixion was not only designed to kill the criminal, it was designed to mutilate his body and dishonor his body. And that is why it was predicted that the Son of Man will be deli delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged, to be despised and to be mutilated and crucified. And that humiliation was usually complete by the victim being nailed completely naked and hung up before the people on the cross. And even then the humiliation of our Lord continued for those who passed him by derided him, wagging their heads. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him. The robbers crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Interesting on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, when Jesus met those two disciples and they began telling him their concerns and their sadness, and they spoke about his death to him. And they said, our chief priests and rulers delivered him up and to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. And Jesus replies, interesting, Jesus replies, said, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus' death by crucifixion was absolutely necessary to the fulfillment of the sovereign plan of God. For salvation. Through Jesus being crucified, that was when his soul was made an offering for guilt and for sin, our guilt and our sin. It was there and then that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And so that's why Paul can declare to the Christians at Corinth, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he went on to declare, we preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Nothing but the death of the Savior by crucifixion would have satisfied the righteous just, the justice of God the Father. It's only death on the cross that could provide total expiation necessary for the Lamb of God to take away the sin 
of the world. And it's in that message of Jesus' shed blood and death by crucifixion that God now invests his great saving power. And it is because it was all designed by his infinite wisdom. And therefore it is that Jesus being delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. We ought never to think of the sufferings and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ as other than fully planned and all executed according to the will of God the Father from start to finish. And isn't that absolutely marvellous? That a great holy God, the holy, righteous, eternal God of all the universe and of all creation should so love you and me, people like us, that he would design such a plan and send his son to fulfill it in absolutely every detail so that you and I and millions of others like us could be eternally saved. How we ought to be so full of praise that the eternal God sent his son into the world to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Don't you want to say hallelujah? What a saviour. Make sure you are resting in him, trusting in his blood, relying upon his death upon the cross for the forgiveness of all your sins. Let's close with this prayer. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>